Greetings and salutations. This is Abe Abdelhadi with The Bitter Truth. Uh, my guest tonight is a gentleman that is uh, got an incredible background. I'm going to get into some of his stuff here really quick, but I want to introduce you all to Chris Ward. Uh, Chris uh, hails from the uh, Denver, Colorado area, and uh, he's a veteran, a real veteran, and he's got some interesting points of view, and that's why I thought it'd be interesting to talk to him. We've got a lot of uh, amazing things going on this week. And so I wanted to uh, bring Chris on the show and just ask him some questions and uh, just kind of jump into it. Chris, are you there? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you on. Uh, you've always been a good friend of mine, and so I appreciate you uh, having me on your show. Hey, man, appreciate you being on the show. Hey, listen, I know you're a veteran, and we've talked about it a lot, uh, but for, for folks that don't know you and don't know, uh, don't know your story, why don't you tell us a little bit about your time in Bosnia? Okay, well, uh, Bosnia was uh, my second stop. I did 11 years in the U.S. Army. I started out in reconnaissance as a cavalry scout and uh, ended up in the, a funny backstory to this was I was actually in, stationed in Korea was my first duty station uh, back in 90, late 95 and 96. And I'll never forget laying in bed one day in my comfy uh, barracks room watching the TV of the soldiers that were part of the first uh, forces moving into Bosnia and they were standing knee deep in snow and I was just thankful that I wasn't one of those yahoos standing out there in Bosnia <laughs> in the snow, just miserable, sleeping in tents. And it's, it's one of those where, like, it comes back and bit me. Eight months later, uh, my unit from Fort Polk is shipped off as part of this first stabilization force in Bosnia in 97. So <laughs> my mockery of the troops got me uh, exactly where I didn't want to be. And so that was, uh, yeah, our first duty state, or the first time I was there uh, was for a year. Um, and then went back again in 2002, and then a third year in 2004. Wow! Okay, so two so and a half years combined in Bosnia. All right. So, uh, can you can you talk about a little bit about what, you, what went down there? Is that is that something that you, is uh, off limits, or can you talk about that a little bit? No, absolutely. No, I can talk about everything. So, the uh, as I mentioned, I, I started my military career in reconnaissance. I worked as a cavalry scout mostly zone area reconnaissance, trafficability of routes, all not very exciting stuff. So in Bosnia, though, our mission had changed. So the combat element, uh, the, the infantry, the, the scouts, the tankers, fulfilled more of a military police role where we had to maintain a safe and secure environment for the local nationals in Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, following a five-year-plus war, uh, civil war that had occurred there, uh, Bar none, one of the you know greatest uh, human rights violations occurred. You know of the following World War II. Uh, of course, not to downplay what happened in Africa at the same in Rwanda at the same time. However, that was my first two missions there. Into the third, things had trans transitioned a little bit. I had determined that my place in the universe was to be in Bosnia, and so I actually went to the Defense Language Institute to continue my studies in Serbian Croatian there in Monterey, California. As I was being deployed back, I'd actually received orders to work as an interpreter in Kosovo. And it was funny is that I ended up in Germany and I still didn't have my permanent duty station orders yet. So I was sitting in Frankfurt and all of a sudden they tell me, well, you're not going to Kosovo anymore. You're actually going to Sarajevo. And I was excited because I'd been to Sarajevo. I love Sarajevo. It sounded a lot more attractive to me than Pristina in Kosovo. So, uh, but they wouldn't tell me what I was doing. So I ended up, uh, after a couple of weeks in Germany, was sent to Sarajevo upon arrival, was picked up. And, you know, it was one of those uh, cloak and dagger kind of scenarios. And I, and I had no experience in intelligence work, but uh, they brought me in uh, the next morning and told me that I was going to be going through a two-week human intelligence course, and I would be part of what they called the Allied Military Intelligence Battalion, which was a uh, NATO-led collective of all the NATO states uh, intelligence assets. So we were trained in human intelligence collection, and so I became uh, one of the one of the few NATO human assets in Boston. Wow. So, okay, this is something that came up in the '90s a lot when I was talking to uh, friends of mine during that whole conflict because I thought it was amazing that we were able to justify going in there to save white Muslims. And I hate to put it that way. My dad's an Arab, so I can talk a little smack, I guess. But we're, you know, we're in there to prevent the Muslim genocide. Don't you think it's a little interesting that 20 years later, we can't stand Muslims, but they all seem to not be white? <laughs> <laughs> 
No, absolutely. And it, the, Bosnia was, it, it's interesting about Bosnia because for years the State Department denied the ethnic, or actually they called it ethnic cleansing because what they did was they whitewashed the, the news coming out of Yugoslavia because they didn't want the word genocide being thrown around. This was an actual thing that mm-hmm. they didn't, uh, because the United States would have had to have taken action in the case of genocide, so they called it ethnic cleansing. And we kept out of it for as long as possible. And you heard a lot of the same rhetoric. I think Warren Christopher was one of the, the State Department heads at the time that said, this is Europe's problem. You know, and that echoed what we heard during World War II yep. uh, when we were talking about the rise of the Nazi party. Uh, was, oh, this is Europe's problem. We're not going to get involved. Well, once the, the images of the concentration camps, you know, here it is the mid-90s, <laughs> and the picture starts flooding back to the United States. People yeah. are like, oh, my God, there are concentration camps over there. Mm-hmm. And once that word was used and the pictures came out, showing the Muslims and the Croatians and so on and so forth, and that's when we got involved. And unlike a lot of other campaigns, that war, when the United States dedicated, I think, like 50,000 troops, and we rolled into Bosnia, across Croatia, with a military might that stopped that war dead in its tracks. I mean, there was not another shot fired after the U.S. stepped ground in Bosnia. And so it was one of those what we considered like an epic win. <laughs> Unfortunately, it would not be the case for our you know, occupation of other countries we've been in since. But the funny thing was is that I think it was because of, uh, it wasn't solely that, there's some other interests that we can talk about, but... The fact that they were white Muslims probably meant a lot more than had they been your your traditional Arab Muslim. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're arming Saudi Arabia to go kill a bunch of Muslims in Yemen, and we don't seem to mind. Exactly, because they don't look like us. Right, absolutely. It's, uh, I, was, I, I, just thought, I just thought that was interesting. And the, and the reason, and the reason I kind of went into your background a little bit and, you know, wanted to kind of, you know, have some of the listeners get to know you a little bit this way was because, you know, you're a real veteran. You've seen some stuff. You've been places. You know, you know, what the what the oath of office is or the veteran, the oath you take to uphold the Constitution and the flag and everything. So you're not just some guy who, you know, maybe did six months in the Army and dropped out. You, you, you're, you're the real deal. And so, you know, just to kind of get into some, a little bit more of your background before I jump into some of the other stuff I wanted to talk about was because I remember – a couple years back, you uh, you participated in the Dapple protest, right? Oh, uh, that is correct. Yeah, so so the Dakota Access Pipeline, you 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 went up with the vets and the American Legion. You organized that in Colorado, didn't you? So it was uh, there were two parts to that. So the the Dakota Access Pipeline, whenever the the locals there at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, they stood in opposition for months. And what happened was Veterans for Peace, which is another. Uh, organization of veterans that they're just by their namesake. They stand in opposition to armed conflict. And so what they wanted to do was work from a logistical standpoint to help facilitate the the Sioux Nation as they go through their daily actions, you know, in protests, you know, peaceful protests, so on and so forth. Building up to what I, what you're referring to is that Wesley Clark Jr., son of famed General Wes Clark, who was actually ironically in charge of <laughs> of uh, Europe during the time of the Balkan conflict, he decided, uh, with part of a, a few other actors, decided to stage a mass veteran. They wanted to move 10,000 veterans into Standing Rock in the in the you know the late latter part of last year to really put, you know, kind of lay, draw a line in the sand that, you know, that we're going to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. So I had moved up there on, it was uh, Thanksgiving Day. I went up there for just a couple of days just as a, uh, to transport supplies. So I didn't position myself up there for long. I didn't even stay on the camp because they were already overtaxed because people were going up there to volunteer that were not bringing supplies. Oh man. So they were, they were taking the food, you know, the clothing, the, the camping equipment, everything from the people who had already been staged there for some time. And so whenever I knew it was going to be a logistical nightmare and it was, but we had with, they had already dedicated so many people. I think we had several dozen from Colorado. We moved up there in two bus loads. And so I helped facilitate the veterans from Colorado just to make sure that our own people were protected to and fro. Mm-hmm. And yeah, same way. They, they went up there completely. Some of them with just the jackets on their back, not realizing that Denver, Colorado weather in November 
and North Dakota <laughs> are like <laughs> are different from like Denver and Austin. Yeah, it's at, like, oh, yeah. It's some, you know, it's not it's not that cold out. Oh yeah, well, it's negative forty when you get up there. Yeah, that, that that kind of weather has always amazed me, man. I'm from L.A. and came to Austin three years ago, and the joke I always make is this is as far east as I go. <laughs> if if I was in Maine or something during the winter, I would be in jail for murder. My, my dad's an Arab, my mother's Brazilian, um, like a Discovery Channel special. You know, they migrated to Los Angeles, not no, not Minnesota. So <laughs> I'm, I'm warm-blooded by, by, by birth. Well, and I appreciate all this because, you know, a lot of what I want to talk about tonight is, you know, getting into the defense and everything. I mean, the, the, the defense budget right now is $700 billion a year listed. Uh, you know, last year when Trump took office, you know, everyone, you know, made a big stink about him asking for $550 billion. He got a unanimous eight, $80 billion tip with nary a peep from the so-called Democrats, popping it up to, you know, $700 billion now. No hearings, nothing. And it's been that way for years. I mean, uh, you know, I think it was at a high of about $300 billion under under Bush. It rose under Obama. It's the war machine. Um, now, some estimates, according to For- including Forbes – have it at $1.3 trillion. And I'm thinking uh, that's got to be, obviously, they're, they're not counting the VA. They're not counting the nuclear program. They're not counting black ops. We have 1,200 bases all over the world. Um, I mean, frankly, we're fucking about everywhere in the world and wondering why people don't like us. Meanwhile, the Chinese, not really a base anywhere. The Russians, they're in Syria. That's about it. And they spend $65 billion on defense. And, and by the way, they have single-payer health care. So, um what do you? Th- why do you think? I, I know what the answer is going to be, but I want to hear you say it. Why do you think um, both parties are so beholden to the defense industry? I mean, as much as I love Bernie Sanders, and none of us are flawless. I mean, he's probably one of the more flawless people to have ever run in the history of the country. Um, not everybody chains themselves to, to to black women during the civil rights protests of the '60s, but. But he's but he's never met a defense appropriation he didn't like, and I know that's because he's from Vermont. And he's got to you know cover his people. But uh, you know why do you think? Because you've lived it, you've seen it. You know I have some veteran friends that tell me some amazing spending horror stories. Why do you think at a one point three trillion dollar budget and twelve hundred bases that we know about, not covering the covert stuff, obviously, mm-hmm. we remain beholden and people keep voting against their own interests. They don't even question this. They'll question welfare. They'll question education. And I'm old enough to have gone to college for free. So that's not a pipe dream. It used to be free. Uh, I went to Cal Poly Pomona, got out in 1987. It cost $125 a quarter to go to that school. Uh, Now that school is four grand a quarter. Uh, I was talking to a good girlfriend of mine who lives here in Austin. She went to UT 30 years ago. And we're talking about this very subject. And I said, how much were you paying to go? She goes, I don't remember. She goes, I think it was about 300 a semester. I said, oh, okay. So it's about, what, 12 grand a year now or 12 grand a semester? She said, yeah, that's about right. I'm like, okay, so what's the difference 30 years later? This isn't when Eisenhower was president, Reagan was president. So all that to say, we obviously don't ask good questions as a culture, but why do you think the military industrial complex, which you know automatically makes me sound paranoid, why do you think they've got such a foothold on the American political system, and they've had for a long time, if not since Korea. Yeah, and I would go way back before Korea. Uh, when you when you look at the, because when we look at our monetary economic system and how we've developed as a nation, it's kind of a monster that we started of our own device, and and henceforth all of our all of our enemies of the state, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, we're all you know creatures from that, uh, you know, offspring of that monster. And I think that when, like you mentioned, the military industrial complex, I, I think that it was first, the first time that the term was phrased was when Eisenhower's farewell address, when he warned the U.S. people uh, of this armistice, you know, industry that had pretty much started to steamroll into something that's uncontrollable. Uh, this was echoed again by JFK, which a lot of people believe led to his assassination, was is that because there are elements in the world, and I think they're multinational. I don't, you know, I don't put my finger on any particular state. I think there's elements in probably all states uh, that have perpetuated the, the this defense spending. But I think it's also a facade because uh, talking with individuals in Washington about defense spending that like you had mentioned, well over $1.2 trillion is what we know of. I know on the books, I think right now it's somewhere around $880 billion, which, like you said, ex- exceeds all of our 
uh, not only our, our, all of our competition, but all of our friends' defense spending as well. But the question is, is that what is that really actually going to? And there are a handful of people that benefit from, like I said, the only people that benefit during a time of war are not the victors or the, or the, you know, the victims of the war, but are actually the people that create the bombs and the bullets. And so they, America, falling by the wayside in, in means of uh, manufacturing jobs and so on and so forth, we've actually made war our major, you know, economic machine that only benefits a fraction, uh, but fueled by the other major industries, the big banks, oil and gas industry. So, you know, we've created this petrodollar that has sustained the American economy uh, for the greater part of a hundred years. And the challenge being is, is that it's gone so far out of control that in order for them to continue through their operations, just even go back and you and I could talk about the seventies and the eighties uh, about the illegal activities, the, the, the illegal weapon Absolutely. sales, let alone the, all the legal weapon sales we're involved in now that are preposterous. You just saw the news. What was it? Two days ago, uh, Trump, another, uh, massive billion dollars billion dollars yep. sales, yeah and in the sale of howitzers to Saudi Arabia right and that's what's interesting too because I remember last year he did the billion dollar sale and then miraculously the Saudis had a hundred million dollars to put it in, into Ivanka Trump's nonprofit which was interesting because on my birthday in 16 Obama sold a billion dollars worth of weapons to the Saudis, and they had put money into Hillary Clinton's campaign. And at that time, I was called, you know, a conspiracy theorist and a kook. Uh, about a week and a half ago, Mother Jones had just put out a, a, a nice expose on all the Clinton Foundation cash that they had received from countries and pay to play, which I'm thinking, okay, you fucking hacks, how come you didn't put that out three years ago? We, we could have used you. You know, now it's like she's got no teeth and she can't hurt you. So, okay, fine. Now now you're going to come after, which is fine. Come after all you want because she's annoying me. But that being said, it's it's interesting that this came through. People are paying attention to it now, but they didn't pay attention to it when Obama was doing it or when Bush was doing it or when Bush allowed 41 bin Laden family members to fly out of the country during the four-day uh, airline grounding after 9-11. And they weren't even debriefed by Secret Service or CIA or FBI or anything. And so, you know, kind of speaking to your point about – um, JFK, you know, we just don't we just don't assassinate people anymore. I mean, which I guess is a good thing. We just marginalize them. We 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 put them out to the side. I mean, I remember when, Mar- um, when I was looking back on Martin Luther King's um, anniversary this last couple of weeks, and a good point was made to me by a friend of mine that as soon as he started talking about Vietnam and the Poor People Campaign, he was dead like a year and a half later, and forgot what article I saw about two months ago when Lyndon Johnson had to call Martin Luther King into his office to let him know that the FBI was going to be dropping their protection. And they both knew that was a death sentence. But that was right about the time he started talking about Vietnam more openly, aggressively, and talking about the poor people's campaign and creating, oh, gee, 50 years later, I'm a radical, you know, equal wages, you know, parity, uh, you know, creating better jobs, uh, Medicare for all, that kind of thing. And it's amazing how when you think about it, it doesn't cost the government any money to split up a lunch counter or to integrate a lunch counter, but it costs them money to get out of Vietnam. <laughs> it costs them money to help the poor, right? And he was dead a year and a half later. So uh, uh, it, it's it, it's amazing how the, how beholden our our politicians are to not just the war machine, like you said, but the big banks, big pharma, uh, big steel, big everything. And it's gotten worse. And what's funny is people. You know the the gun right guys, and I own a gun, right? I hate to have to say it, but I own a thirty eight, so whatever. But uh, I don't think I need a tank. I don't think I need a hand grenade. Okay, I don't. I, I don't need a howitzer. But when you talk about that, and was like, they're taking away our rights. Okay, you haven't been paying attention then, because Obama signed the NDAA in two thousand eleven, and took away habeas corpus. I mean, I could be jailed like a Gitmo prisoner now on a tweet if the government wanted to. Um, you know, Bush signed Patriot Acts one and two in the early 2000s, right after the, the 9-11. So basically what you've got is all the stuff that Nixon got busted for is now suddenly legal, 
which is why when Obama was chasing Snowden out of the country and using the IRS to hassle journalists, hmm, Nixon used the IRS to hassle journalists. You know, he just got busted on tape for it. And so now it's legal. And so this is where I get, I get kind of, I get, I get angry. So I try not to, I try not to be angry. So I'm trying to modulate my tone, but when you get into, you know, the, the death economy that we have created, and if you get into Chile and their copper industry and what we did to Allende, for example, installing a ghost of Pinochet, you know, everyone's going on about Assad being a butcher and a dictator. Yeah, well, Pinochet was our man for 27 years and he killed a bunch of people too, but he played ball with American copper, so we didn't care, right? Same, same thing with Ecuador, same thing with Panama, same thing with Guatemala and Honduras, United Fruit, I can go on and on. But I wanted to talk about something a little more recent. Um, I just read recently that uh, we're getting ready to uh, mine lithium in Afghanistan. And it's estimated there's about a trillion dollars of lithium still in the ground. And we're supposed to go in and get it. Now, there has been, now over, this isn't a new thing. It just hasn't worked out. But we're, it's going to be new for us because we've never uh, put anybody in there to try to extract uh, minerals out of lithium or out, out of Afghanistan, rather. They've got iron ore, they've got silver, they've got gold, but specifically they have about a trillion dollars in lithium. And for anybody that doesn't know why lithium, well, that's, if you got a cell phone, lithium, batteries, you know, that's, it's a, it's a very vi- valuable mineral. So um, I know that Ch- uh, China acquired a 30-year lease in a copper mine in Afghanistan for about $3 billion in 2008. But the um, Taliban, you know, even though they're cooperating with them, saying, hey, we're not going to target it. We're not going to blow it up. They still haven't been able to successfully uh, get anything out of it, mostly because of the bad roads and it's hard to truck that stuff out of there. But we're still, you know, you know us. We're, we're going to probably pay a bunch of American contractors to go in there and, you know, can't do single payer for all, but we're going to we're going to lay rail in Afghanistan <laughs> and we're going to do all this, you know, stuff. You know, and then and then also, too, from all the years of, people going in, they're trying to mine Afghanistan. There's like an estimated $300 million of unpaid taxes to the Afghan government that a lot of private companies owe. So I guess the first question I got to ask you, knowing what you know, why would the U.S. be any different? Why would we be any different from some of the other countries that have tried to get in there and get lithium or gold or whatever? We're not. Whenever I think about Afghanistan, I also have to think about over uh, during the uh, conflict in Darfur, in Africa, and when somebody had pleaded, let's hope that America finds oil here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's amazing what conflict. So we did, when we painted up the Afghanistan mission, they said, you know, the Taliban were on the rise. We need uh, the, the, the violations of human rights were off the charts, and we needed to create a better way of life and create a safe and secure environment and still, you know, work with the, the local government, you know, make sure that the Afghan government is able to, you know, sustain, you know, peaceful existence and so on and so forth, which has been a nightmare since inception. As uh, a matter of fact, when I worked with the Russians, uh, some of their old command that had actually um, uh, been deployed to Afghanistan asked me, they're like, why in the world would America decide to take on a campaign like Afghanistan? they like, this is a thousand year effort <laughs> that... that <laughs> And it's because of what's in the ground and what's growing in the ground. So um, we had saw, I had had, not having served in Afghanistan myself, but a lot of my friends, even a half brother that had served there, um, one or several had admitted to uh, one of their duties was sitting in a Humvee, uh, surrounding, uh, sitting outside of an opium field, making sure that none of the, the Taliban uh, attacked it. And so, what we saw once the you know the U.S. had a stronghold in Afghanistan was this mountain of uh, now Afghanistan has just reached the highest export of opium in history. And what a coincidence! And what and, a coinc- not to cut you off, but what a coincidence that we've got an opioid ac- epidemic that includes, but is not limited to, say, Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. Right. And wow, what a what a coincidence that you know we've got more opium, and big pharma is getting it cheaper. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being stupid, but please continue. No, and it's amazing to me is because because of this, and, and it's uh, it's like we have all the dots to show what the picture looks like, but not enough of the lines to connect the dots, so people discount it. They're like, oh, they just write it off. Like, I mean, we can go back there and talk about all the politicians and what they've done to help facilitate massive weapons sales. But with Afghanistan. Here we are in a situation where we do have a wealth of, uh, you know, and we ran into the same situation in uh, in Kazakhstan, 
was a massive natural gas reserve, but didn't have the infrastructure in place to be able to extract it. So there's this little hidden war between China, Russia, and the United States to procure the natural gas in, you know, the former Soviet Republic. So that never gets any news because it's, you know, a formidable wasteland, not unlike Afghanistan, but we still try to pretend that, and this is what the U.S. tells its people, is that we're trying to protect the Afghan people against the Taliban. And the whole purpose there is to maintain an environment until we can put in a puppet government uh, in which we can lay claim to all the, the, you know, the natural resources that are laying under the ground and continue, of course, the export of opium, which ha- has more than been highlighted that the international drug trade, legal and illegal, has been fueling these wars uh, for decades. Well, see, so that's why the U.S. is still in Afghanistan. Well, and then, and then last spring, when Trump dropped the mother of all bombs, the Moab, right, in Afghanistan, and killed like 1,600 people. And it's always amazing to me when they say, oh, we don't know. The estimates are kind of, we don't know. Like, really, you don't know? Really, you got all this math and all these computers and all these metrics, but you don't know. And that $300 million bomb was purchased during the Bush administration. So it sat for at least 10 years. That's $300 million. It could have gone to a lot of different things, right? And we dropped that bomb on these people. By the way, a country half the size population-wise of Wyoming and while Wyoming has a $32 billion GDP, Afghanistan has a $20 billion GDP. And we're carpet bombing a piece of dirt. I mean, Arizona has more stuff in it than Afghanistan. I mean, it's just right. there's, there's nothing there anymore. And protecting the people from what? You know what I mean? It's, and, and since when do we have to protect the people? You know, the, the, if you look at the history of any of these conflicts and you, you get into – um, you know, like I was talking about Honduras and Nicaragua, Iraq, you know, Iran, we made a deal because Iran, we know they got nukes. We soft peddled it in the States, but you don't make a deal for $400 million unless somebody's got some nukes, right? But all that to say that the, 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 the narrative is always we're protecting, we're protecting, we're protecting, but why do we have to, why are the American people so easily sold on that narrative? Do they still believe it? I guess is my question. Yeah, it's, I think that the, the, the faith in the U.S. government, uh, I think, according to recent Gallup polls, is, is probably as low as it's ever been. Uh, people don't believe the government. They, I think the majority believe that they're being lied to. We've exposed the media as just, you know, as orchestrate, you know, just propelling this message from their corporate overlords about what the consumers need to hear and believe and sadly, we do have a percentage in the United States that still subscribes to America as the greatest country in the world. We do no wrong. We're so, so star-spangled, blinded uh, by that propaganda machine that they truly believe. You know, I was in, I was, I'll was. i never forget, I was in Tombstone, Arizona. Anybody that's ever been there knows that it's, it's all of like three city blocks wide wow. <laughs> or long. It's country, little hick town. Everybody's walking around like it's late 1800s. It's really fun to place to spend the weekend. And I was talking to a gentleman who had two stick shooters on his waist. And, of course, people walk around there like they're in the 1800s, so I didn't play it in no mind. But I noticed that they that there was ammunition in the, so they weren't for show. He actually had them loaded. And so I said, well, I said, what, what do you feel like, um, you know, what's the need to carry around these six shooters? And he looked me honestly in the eyes and said, it's because of all the terrorists running around. In Tombstone. And I was... In Tombstone, Arizona. Tombstone, Arizona. <laughs> uh, did, did, Tombstone, Arizona is no more of a terrorist threat, like terrorist, like opportunity. I mean, that would make zero news. <laughs> do they? Do they? Do they even have a Mexican like, in Tombstone? No, no. It's all just white. It's Actually, white, right? It's all, okay. Like, most of them are like retired military people, <laughs> so they're paranoid anyway. But it was funny to me is, is that people believe that if we don't keep the the enemy at bay, so if we're not killing them in their own country then we're going to have to kill them on our doorsteps. And that's what people don't want. And it's amazing that people actually believe that, have never met a terrorist themselves. Right. You know, but wouldn't recognize a terrorist if they were walking down the street. However, they're convinced that ISIS will be on your doorstep if we're not killing them over in Syria. See, this is the thing that drives me crazy. You're, you're hitting the nail right on the head because I'm in Austin, Texas, right? We've got a base here. If the Germans had a base in Corpus Christi, we'd lose our fucking mind. 
I'm from LA. If the Italians had a base in LA, or if the Japanese had a base in Portland, Oregon, we'd lose our fucking mind. Yet we've got 50,000 troops in Japan. And why? And we're definitely not the most popular there. You know, there's all these rape <laughs> cases and all this shit that goes down. And it's about perspective, right? So when you everything you're talking about, you're right. Have they ever met a terrorist? You know, most people would say no, right? They might have an Arab buddy that works at their engineering firm or whatever. And I know that's stereotypical, so I'll stop it. But all that, because <laughs> you know, you know, I'm going to get people. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to do on the liner. They're going to do in the little, the little comment section. But no, but the thing is, is it's about perspective, right? Like in Vietnam, they don't call the Vietnam War the Vietnam War. They call it the American War. Okay, and right. you know, so a, a couple of months back, I was reading some Esquire article, and David Frum, you know, Mister Axis of Evil, you know, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, uh, that mm-hmm. guy, that David Frum prick, um, you know, basically talked us into a, into a war. Uh, you know, was pitched and gave this to Bush and, you know, axis of evil, the axis of evil. Okay, it's about perspective, right? Let's just look at North Korea, for example, right? Okay, Kim Jong-un, you know, he inherited the country from his old man. Honestly, do you believe that little guy is going to risk his palace and his co cores and everything on principle? Not at all. No, he's doing the nuclear testing because we keep buzzing his borders with B-52s that come from where? Hmm, Guam. Okay, so why is he o- nuclear testing over Guam? Why is his old man? What, his old? Why did his old man, you know, test weapons over Guam and Japan? That's because that's where the American troops are. Why do they threaten South Korea all the time? Because the last time the Americans were in North Korea, we turned it into Puerto Rico after the flood, wiped it out, killed a million civilians, lost about sixty thousand of our own. Doesn't that sound eerily familiar? That number, and ever since have been just doing practice drills and everything else. They're scared of us. They're a tiny country of about 30 million people. They're scared of us. That's why they do that. But the American narrative, the American exceptionalism, the Rachel Maddow's of the world, the Sean Hannity's of the world, oh, he's insane. He's insane. I would go fucking crazy too if you're buzzing my borders and risking my house roughly every day with B-52s going back and forth, back and forth, right? You know, Iran, I I remember when my dad's an Arab. I'm, I'm first generation. So I remember I would hear these stories in the 70s when I was a kid, and I thought, ah, the old man, he's whacked. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Then I get to college, and I read up on this stuff, and I'm going, oh, shit. He wasn't crazy. Uh, so, w- w- for example, I was in high school when the, uh, when the Iranians took over the uh, American embassy, okay? So my dad's telling me all about Mohammed Mossadegh in the 1951 election. It was democratically held. They overthrew the Shah. They had a real election. They elected this guy. And everything was going to be fine until he was going to tell BP and Standard Oil at the time to go screw themselves, and he was going to nationalize Iranian oil. He lasted two years. Kermit Roosevelt, nephew of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, was CIA, the, one of the first CIA guys, in a brilliant coup, overthrew President Mossadegh and reinstalled the Shah, where for the next 26 years, he mass murdered his own people. But he was our guy, so it was okay. When Assad does it, it's bad because we want to run a natural gas pipeline from Saudi Arabia into Turkey. So he's bad. But the Shah, he was good. Well, the Iranian people had had enough. And they went extreme, went rogue, went Muslim, took over the embassy, held hostages for over 400 days to make sure that MI6, CIA, everybody was out of the country. And then they let them go as soon as Reagan was was elected, right? It's about perspective. Right. If, if you've seen people fucking about in your country for years and years and years, you're going to get mad at the country that's screwing with you. But in America, we're told, oh, they're crazy. They hate our freedom. They hate our freedom. You know, Iraq. I mean, those guys took as big of a screwing as the American Indian. No joke. I mean, yeah, Hussein was a dictator. No kidding. But like you said earlier, he was our boy for 13 years. He fought Iran for eight years until they finally yeah. called it a wash, but not before a half a million people were killed, Right. And so, and then, and then, you know, the whole the first war, the the first Desert Storm war. Why did why did he invade Kuwait? We gave him permission. The American ambassador at that time was a woman named April Glaspie, and you could look her up: G L A S P I E. She was the American ambassador at that time. And I remember when I was a kid, this came out, page seventeen of the A section of the L.A. Times. This is before the internet. A little Senate subcommittee hearing on the war. She was called in a, into Hussein's office. He asked what the American opinion on Arab-Arab conflict was, his exact words. And she said, we don't have an opinion on Arab-Arab conflict, just don't invade Israel. He's like, okay, because Kuwait was cross-drilling into his oil supply and selling his oil cheaper. And so (laughs) he went ahead and said, okay, great, I got permission. And he went in there. And that's why Bush gave him the three months to get out. 
because he knew we had screwed up and Bush one had actually been shot at, unlike his son, who was doing coke off of whores' butts in, in, in South Texas during the National Guard, <laughs> avoiding the war. I'm not bitter. I'm just saying. But all that to say, it's about perspective. So the Iraqis don't have a good taste in their mouths. And then this last debacle that we went into under the sun, we killed a million Iraqis, it's estimated. We've lost 8,000 of our kids for what? What, 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 freedom right. did we, what freedom did we fight for? You know, and, this, and, this, and these are things, you know, I kind of paraphrase Tony Robbins in this instance because I know he didn't mean this in this way, but I do. If you want a better quality of life, you've got to ask a better question, right? And we as a culture in this country do not ask any questions. You know, the other day I put up a little meme on Facebook, which I Googled first to make sure it was true. In 2016, the Japanese had 10 homicides by gun, 10, in a country of 127 million people, right? We got 340 million people in this country. We had 33,000 homicides by gun. Now, let's be fair, many of those are suicides. 93 suicides a day by gun, 22 of those are vets. So that's another question. But let's just call it a wash and say 8,000 people were killed by guns. Compared to the 10 of the Japanese, aren't we going to even ask how you do it? Hey, that's kind of a neat trick. How do you do that? You know, we're, we're not even asking. It's like, we, we don't even want to ask that question. It's like, you're a communist. It's, so it, it all gets, to, gets, back to, gets down to perspective and how things hold, how people hold things. Do you remember when Trump ran uh, in 2016, one of the things he kept bitching about? And of course, everybody jumped on this. He was demanding that NATO nations pitch in toward their defense. American people have been carrying the bill too long. They need to, oh, they, yeah. they need to pony up for their defense. We've been, we've been carrying this shit too long. When the smoke cleared, what that meant was the NATO nations had to spend 2% of their GDP buying American weapons. So Yeah, NATO has always been U.S.-led. Like, they make it sound like it's some massive, but you, you, the NATO forces have always been led by a U.S. commander. Okay, continue on that point, because that's something I'm not too familiar with. So, I mean, I know it's a U.S. commander, but if you're saying it's not a conjunction, right? Well, it is. I mean, you have your NATO allies, so North Atlantic Treaty Organization is what is comprised of a lot of your uh, European, U.S., you know, we're all allies here uh, as a NATO force, quick reactionary to, you know, situations like what happened in Bosnia. I mean, NATO is a huge that was pretty much who led, it was NATO-led coalition forces that uh, went into Bosnia. And But whenever they created NATO, they said it's always going to be under U.S. And all, of, uh, as you just alluded to, all of the NATO-allied countries were going to have to pay <laughs> uh, uh, rears to their U.S. overlord. So, by the way, of uh, taxation uh, purchasing of uh, U.S. weapons. So right, okay. our NATO allied countries all carried M16s. They walk around in, you know, almost the exact same combat uh, fatigues. Uh, even when I was in Korea, in South Korea, they they drove around in Bradley fighting vehicles. That's wow. our uh, up armored personnel carrier. Wow. They carried M16s. They wore the same uh, uh, forest camouflage uh, uniforms. Of course, they had different patches, but. Uh, through night vision goggles, you couldn't discriminate between a South Korean soldier and a U.S. soldier. So NATO nations have always purchased U.S. weapons, but now we made the mandatory 2% of their GDP must go to U.S. weapons. That's new, correct? Right. Yes. Okay, so, so that's where Trump is coming in with they're paying their fair share, and now their fair share means they're just buying more shit from us. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Okay, so here's the thing. While, while these guys are industrialized countries— you know, they're not nearly in the same condition that, say, you know, um, El Salvador was, for example. But it's the same deal where we demand countries to borrow our money to buy our shit only to have their resources and their citizens use as collateral in loans that can never be repaid. This is going to end up being – this is going to end up in austerity measures, kind of maybe like in Greece or even in Italy. Am I, is, that, is that too far off to assume? No, absolutely not. I mean, a big picture, this is how the World Bank made slaves of nations is because they made loans to countries that they knew could never repay them, and now we're in a forever debt wheel, and the people didn't play along, like Syria, are forever enemies of the state until we can replace them with some new public government. See, and that's the thing that, and that's the thing that, it bleeds over. It bleeds over. This good friend of mine I was talking to tonight about education, she specifically called me with a quote-unquote Syria question, because she, sweet as she is, awesome person, like many of my friends, labor under the delusion of good guys and bad guys. And 
think that I'm cynical, for example, because it's not about good guys and bad guys. Where there's money, there is no coincidence. And it's emotionally and intellectually dishonest to assume that if I'm giving a politician money, it, that it's a coincidence that they're actually doing something that, that, that aligns with my interests. It doesn't operate anywhere in the world. The question I always ask people is, you have a job or run a business? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you trade dollars for those services or your time at your job, do you not? Yes. So why would it be any different if I'm giving money to Senator so-and-so or I'm contributing to Senator so-and-so or you know President so-and-so, uh, why would I assume that I'm going to get a different reaction. Like Jeffrey Katzenberg, and I'll just flat out say because this is, this is printed, Jeffrey Katzenberg last August gave $20 million to the Young Turks. All of a sudden, the Young Turks are on Russia, 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 like it's CNN or MSNBC. Right. What a coincidence that one of the Hillary Clinton's largest personal contributors put $20 million into an enterprise just because he thought it'd be good business, which I'm, it, it is a good business. The Young Turks are the largest internet news source. I think they have like 5 million viewers or some ridiculous number. It's almost like cable. All right. But- isn't it interesting that their narrative completely changed after they took an infusion of cash from a guy? I, wow, I don't know. I'm just saying. You know. Well, we saw. I mean, you saw Rachel Maddow do the exact. I love how you always post Mad Cow. That's. <laughs> I'm only quoting. I'm only quoting. I wish I made that up, but I like it a lot, so I'm going to oh, steal it. Oh, that's so funny. But uh, we saw her do the exact same thing. Like in the in, in the initial months of the Sanders campaign. She was all about, I mean, she was just pouring fuel on the fire about this up and coming, you know, uh, political revolution that's just changing the national narrative on our approach to politics and campaign finance reform and this and that. And then all of a sudden, once they kind of, once they were about to reach parallel, all of a sudden she's like, flip. Now it's all Clinton. Oh, listen. Like, Where did you go? Oh, oh, dude. Okay. All these millionaire comedians lost me as soon as Bernie bought it, because I'll tell you what happened. Um, I mean, Bill Maher, I always had a love-hate relationship with that guy, uh, mostly because I used to always believe that whether or not I agreed with him, he was, he was telling the truth. He was being honest, right? And he was Bernie, Bernie, Bernie until the day after the convention. And then he shows up on his show. And that same week, he's like, okay, you guys, we got to look sharp. Got to get going. Got to, can't let Trump be in office. I'm like, Excuse me. I'm sorry. If Hillary Clinton had an R next to her name, you'd be paying attention to all the crap her and her dopey-ass husband been doing for 30 years, along with Al Gore and the, su- the pseudo-neoliberal, neoconservative movement, which is the same goddamn thing. We got one big party in this country, and it's just a big right-wing party. One wing of the party happens to be a bunch of yahoos who believe in a 6,000-year-old cartoon, and they like guns and they hate gay people. The other side, they like gay people, hate guns, and they're pro-abortion, Right. That's right. about the only differences. Everything else, they take money from GE, GM, the Koch brothers, Big Pharma, Big Insurance, all of it. You know, Chuck Schumer? You kidding? Nancy Pelosi? That's the that's the leadership of the so-called Democratic Party? And then and, and then this 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 stupid shit they've been doing in this primary season with 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 the with the midterms telling any Democratic candidate who's probably a justice Democrat or an independent, don't talk too much smack on the incumbent or the mainstream Democratic person just in case they win and run in the general. We don't want anything negative. I'm sorry, I missed the meeting where I owe you my vote. See, right. back in the day, guys used to go campaign. And I'll take a little side uh, road here on third parties really quick because that was driving me crazy a couple years back, drives me crazy every election cycle when people go on about third parties and say that they can't win. Well, they can't win because you won't vote for them because you, you're sheep. Right. If everybody would vote, if half the people that didn't want to vote came out and voted for Jill Stein or Gary Johnson, and those guys got 20% of the vote. The narrative would change dramatically by these midterms, if not by 2020, right? Everybody, everybody forgets that Abraham Lincoln ran as a third party. The Republican Party was started in 1856. He got his ass kicked by Stephen Douglas in 1858 for the Senate. Then he ran in 1860 because they had nobody else, and he gave a good speech. Doesn't that sound familiar? So <laughs> President Nobel, I, I, could, I, could, I could do a whole hour on his Mideast tour and how that panned out. But so Lincoln runs in 1860, takes 39% of the vote, right? The Northern Democrats, because they had been split at the time over abolition and the slavery issue. So the Northern Democrats took 29% of the vote. The Southern Democrats took 19% of the vote. The Constitutionalist Party took 9% of the vote. Lincoln won with not even a majority of the vote in 1860 with Morse code and the Pony Express. No internet, no phone, no TV, no nothing, right? So why can't a third party win? Could it be that you're possibly brainwashed by the corporate media 
which only six conglomerates own everything now since 1996 when Clinton deregulated the communications business. It, it's, it's that kind of thing that drives me really batty. So when you're talking about American exceptionalism, it, it applies to the so-called left because they say the same stupid shit. You know, you're, oh, you're Bernie bro. Get over it. It's history. Okay. Your chick lost, man. Get over it. She's running around like, like, like a chicken with a throat cut, pushing a stupid book about what happened. In the history of this country, we've never had a loser run around for a year and a half <laughs> talking about what happened, except for the fact they blame themselves for being a shitty candidate. Well, you know, in, in relation to her, you know, I brought it up because, you know, I remembered uh, prior, uh, around September 11, 2001, during the attack on New York, um, it, when... Um, Hillary was still the, uh, or, or when she was senator of New York, uh, she'd actually sat on the Armed Services Committee, uh, and one of the subcommittees being the Armed Services Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Capabilities. And prior to 9-11, intelligence assets in, in several different divisions had been investigating Saudi Arabia's involvement in a potential attack on the United States. And so I had to believe that because of where she was and in her position, that she had to have been briefed that Saudi Arabia was under investigation. Sure. Uh, however, you know, uh, she becomes Secretary of State. Kingdom Saudi Arabia contributes ten million dollars to the Clinton Foundation, and then they had they had proved that while she was in the State Department, approves a weapon sale of over one hundred sixty-five billion dollars worth of commercial arms sales to 20 different uh, organizations that had uh, uh, invested in the Clinton Foundation, I was like, to me, if that wasn't the biggest, uh, you know, spotlight on uh, a person being in a position of uh, being influenced uh, by, by big monies, that should have discredited her for, for qualifications for the Office of the Presidency. Here's somebody who is allegedly knows about the investigation into Saudi Arabia and is still going to grieve the skids for one of the largest. It was up to that point. I think that single deal with Saudi Arabia was $75 billion. The largest weapons deal in American history took place with a country that was being investigated for the largest attack on U.S. soil ever. I was like, and, this, and that stuck to no, like no one brought that up during their campaign. Well, and, 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 to, and to me, you know, anybody who was for the Iraq war is automatically disqualified from running. No, you know, absolutely. Like, like everybody's listening to, you know, well, Robert Mueller and the FBI with all this Russia horse shit. And I'm sitting there going, huh, didn't Mueller get in front of the Senate, swore to God and everybody that Iraq had WMDs? Absolutely. And, and so I'm going to listen to this guy. And by the way, you keep punching Trump from the right. Fucking idiots. Don't you understand that this is the same FBI and CIA that infiltrated the Black Panthers, fucked over Martin Luther King, screwed over the labor unions, has been messing with Occupy and Black Lives Matter? Anything that is, quote, subversive to the establishment, they haven't they haven't seen a movie or two and they haven't read any philosophy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you keep pushing the people down and what's going to happen? Um, it, it, um, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we're kind of running out of time almost, but and this has been great. But I want to ask you a couple of real qu uh, quick questions really fast because you, you mentioned the petrodollar earlier, okay? And... You know, it, it, we, we, we've talked about some examples, Ecuador, Nicaragua, El Salvador, you know, uh, Honduras, Chile, uh, Panama. You know, I didn't even talk about Panama in any detail tonight. That, that should, we should do an hour on Panama. But all that to say that we've been running this death economy for a long time. I mean, how long before we wake up, you think? Is, you think there's going to be rioting in the streets? How long before we wake up and start to turn this around? Trump announced the idea that he was going to have a, a military parade to be hosted on Veterans Day this year, <laughs> which I will assure you will be the largest protested event probably in American history, because you have a huge contingent of veteran forces uh, spread out. I mean, you think of how big the military is. Now think about how big the veteran community is. Yeah. In strong opposition to a military parade because of... The same thing is, is that they say that this is the work of a fascist government to parade your military might around in, in, you know, in front of the cameras. They immediately think of this is where we, you know, like they brought up during uh, the Sanders campaign. They're like, oh, this is something Stalin would do. <laughs> <laughs> this is something North Korea would do. Right. And, you know, to me, 
I was like, we've already, so they just exposed just in the last year that we cannot work. We, we, we've got over 21 trillion, trillion dollars missing from the accounting books between the Department of Defense and HUD unaccounted for. And you're going to have the audacity to go back to Congress and say, hey, I want to have a parade. It's going to cost $350 million to orchestrate. And I'm like, no, you're not allowed to ask for a nickel until you get your books right. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and then so uh, and, how, okay. how, is the, how is the country not tearing this? You know, I, why aren't all the government buildings burnt to the ground right now? And I'm probably going to get arrested for just even proposing that. But, yeah, you got you got no rights no more, man. So you better be careful. I know, no. Well, and, and this, I, yeah, once you post on Facebook, it, it, it's funny today. The big meme going around is everybody's joking about how Mark Zuckerberg sitting in front of Congress, being railed about how, how his lack of transparency and and, uh, and and violation of of citizens' rights. And I'm like, our Congress is drilling Mark Zuckerberg on a violation of citizens' rights yeah. in relation to personal security and and protection of information. I was like, are you kidding? That, that alone is, I, put, I, I reposted one of the articles of him t- testifying, and I kind of quoted a fake congressman. I said, um, Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, you can go home now. We really don't give a shit when you did this in 2012 for Barack Obama. So we really don't care now. Sorry to have taken your time. And the other meme I posted was, uh, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for your time. We are going to now nationalize Facebook, make it a public utility, and pay you $1 million for the privilege. Now go fuck yourself. Thank you very much. This meeting's adjourned. Oh, you know. he would take it and go. <laughs> Oh, oh, he, he would have done. No, he would have no problem. He would take the money and run. Yeah, so, he, the million, he million, was, not a billion, million dollars. That's how. That's how low they give it to him. Oh yeah. So it was. It was comical years ago, um, probably around the advent of. I would say it was during MySpace, right when people started to transition. It was about a decade ago, and I was talking to a CIA agent about social media because up until I decided, uh, because I was on a path to the CIA. That was where the, the direction I wanted to go in after I got out of Bosnia. This map, I, I learned a lot about American involvement in the financing, training, uh, and supply of international terrorists. Open source now. I mean, it's not like I'm sharing anything that's top secret. But uh, and I was just disgusted. I was like, I cannot work for an organization or you know a government that is feeding our children to a to a death trap that we created. And so I was like, I'm not going to have any part in it whatsoever. And so I got out, got into social media, and I was, and I was talking to a CIA agent. And he said, Chris, social media is the best thing to happen for the intelligence community ever. Oh, yeah. Because people are just giving their shit away. Oh, and I could do an hour on Echo. My girlfriend and I were, <laughs> were, were playing with that. You say certain things to Echo, comes back very interesting. Hey, listen, man, um, in wrapping up, because I, I, uh, I, I could do this for, for, for nine hours, um, it's funny. I've known you what ten, twelve years. I could do this ten, twelve more years. Um, but so, so here's the thing. So you you've referenced the petrodollar earlier, okay? And we know, and we know that whole story. We know that we know that since seventy three, at least the the U S economy has been bolstered by oil. I mean, the dollar is backed by oil. It's not backed by nothing. It's backed by oil. Um, yeah. And we and we print dollars. That's our industry now. We just print and ship dollars. But here's the thing, and this is why we keep loaning these countries money and doing all this stuff. But I guess kind of my last question, and I want to you know, end on what you have to say about this. Uh, should we be concerned that China and Norway and countries like that and Sweden are loaning third world countries monies at way lower interest rates, way more favorable conditions, not making them buy their crap, not enslaving their people for three cents a day, uh, you know, not making dictators have to choose between health care and uh, – um, and 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 the and the will of the corporation, you know, and I personally think this is a, a a way they're trying to subvert our supremacy as the U.S. currency or the world currency, rather. What what do you think of that? Do you think we're going to have a flood of dollars coming back into this country in the next five to ten years and end up like Germany in World War One, or what? What do you think is going to happen? No, I, I, honestly, you know, without and to me, I've got you know, with all of our Reddit this evening, I still believe that. I see a bright, shiny future for humanity. I, I still see, you know, maybe I'm just looking through rose-colored glasses, but I think humans will overcome this as a, as a collective. But as far as the monetary economic system, the, the U.S. dollar, USD, I believe is destined for collapse only because it was a system that was created. Uh, it's a, it's a, a perpetual debt machine, meaning that 
the value of the dollar is going to continue to drop. The buying power is damn near nothing now compared to what it was even 50 years ago. Uh, and so a lot of people, the, the price of inflation continues to rise while our wages have been stagnated for 40, 50 years. So we're running into a situation where the U.S. dollar ultimately is just going to become null and void. Like it's going to have to zero itself out because right now, and this is open source as well, the amount of money that's in computers, so the little ones and zeros, yep. exceeds the actual printed paper that is in existence, meaning that all the money they're loaning other countries is all bullshit. Right. <laughs> wow. It's monopoly money and because it's not worth even the, the dollar that is the number one that's even on the dollar bill. The, that bill is not even worth that. Even And when they joke about it, they say it's not worth the paper it's printed on. That's the USD. And the challenge being is, is that if we don't create, you know, I, I am in all favor of moving to a decentralized uh, currency. Now, not unlike, you know, a lot of what you're seeing in the rise of cryptocurrencies, because I believe that the market should dictate the value of the currency, you know, as in other, in other countries. Let us trade with these other foreign uh, currencies and move to a decentralized bank. That way, you don't have a bunch of old men sitting in a room determining what the, in the inflation rates are going to be like. Wow. Man, man, listen, this has been great. I really appreciate the time. Uh, folks, uh, my name is Abe Abdelhadi, and my guest tonight has been uh, Mr. Chris Ward. And uh, frankly, folks, if this makes you uncomfortable, it's supposed to, so sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs>